Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance from God, our loving Father, and Jesus, our living Redeemer and Savior. When Jesus was asked in Matthew chapter 23, it was in Holy Week, by a Pharisee, what is the great commandment in the law? He replied, these words, verse 37, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. Then next week we'll see that Jesus followed by saying, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But today we look at that first great command of the law summarized in the first three commandments. Dear people of God, dearly loved by Jesus, so much so that he poured out his life's blood for you. With thanksgiving to God for this opportunity, may the Holy Spirit bolster you in the firm foundation of a Bible-based and Christ-centered faith. By the way, at the beginning, we ought to dispel all myths. A catechism was not Martin Luther's invention. There were a number of catechisms in the church that existed for hundreds of years before Luther came along with this one, and and there are certain circumstances that spawned the origin of this one. For a long time, there had been collections of Christian teaching in the form of questions and answers, usually They included the Ten Commandments, the Creed, and the Lord's Prayer, and whatever else that people thought was important, church leaders thought was important. The Reformation of the Church, dated to October 31st, 1517, had been about 10 years along, and Elector John, who was head over the people of Saxony, Elector John was deeply concerned about the welfare of the souls of his people, his subjects. And so he commissioned the theological faculty where Luther was the leader, really. He commissioned the theological faculty of the university to go and send visitors, make a visitation out into the Saxon countryside and see how things were going with the Reformation teaching. See what condition spiritually they would find out there. And so this took place late fall of 1528, and the discoveries of the inadequacies in teaching the faith were just shocking and utterly appalling to these visitors, and as they returned, they shared their observations and what they found. They found that many people were ignorant of basic biblical teaching. Quite often, priests, too, were unprepared and ill-equipped to teach. In one church, they found there wasn't even a Bible, hadn't been for 23 years because of a fire, And they realized, whoa, things don't look good out there. The Christian faith and state of the people is abysmal, really. And Luther sprang into action. Within two weeks, the Ten Commandments were published in a wall poster. And then within a few more weeks, uh, they immediately sold out, by the way. Within a few more weeks, more were published. And then more wall posters followed on the creed, the Lord's Prayer, baptism, confession, and the Lord's Supper. And then the catechism in book form finally got published. Luther merely sought to summarize what it means to live and be a child of God, what it means to be justified by faith in Christ and living amid that reality, what it means to be both saint and sinner at the same time. And at the most basic level, Luther sought to present God's word in an orderly arrangement from law to gospel. And thus the catechism begins, as we do with the Ten Commandments. And by the way, if you've got your catechism with you, I would just have you note that pages 13 through 40 are really the things that Luther wrote and published. That's that's just this. You can see why it was called the small catechism. But wait. How did it get to be so big, over 400 pages? Well, over time, kind of, it was like an accordion in storage. You take it out, and to use it, you have to expand it. Questions and answers. Bible passages that remind us, oh, that is the correct answer, and that's the nuance of why it has to be worded this way and learned this way, etc. And so then Bible passages were added and printed, and so it got bigger 
and bigger because of that. So you've got the basic catechism in the first 27 pages, and then you've got the expanded version, which blesses in many, many ways, as we shall soon see. So the first commandment. You've got it printed for you in some fashion in front of you, even if you don't have your catechism, but it is on page 13 or page 58. First commandment, you shall have no other gods. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. It's okay to say it with me as we do this, by the way. First commandment, you shall have no other gods. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. So the central thought is, all people everywhere are constantly looking for happiness, identity, security, and meaning in life. Where do people today look for these things? And the Catechism supplies a great answer for us. As Christians, we look to the true God, the one true God for all that we need. This is the God who created us and sustains us, who redeemed us by giving himself to be crucified for us in the God-man, Jesus Christ, and who sanctifies us through the power of his Holy Spirit. There is no other God than him. Sadly, this past Tuesday, I saw in the news that a man aged 50 from Colorado burned himself alive, it's called self-immolation, burned himself alive in a Buddhist ceremony in front of the Supreme Court. I guess he was protesting something about the climate, but I'm sure there was a lot of heat around as he was frying up. Really now, what are you willing to die for? The climate? They can't even always get it right as to when, if ever, it's going to rain on a certain day, or when it's going to be cloudy and when it's not. But set that aside. Think now, what would you give up your life for? What would you forfeit your life for? Is it for your God who has made you, redeemed you, and given you his spirit as a pledge and guarantee of eternal life with him? The commandments flow from a relationship with this God who has made you his own. Go into Exodus chapter 20 and the very first thing you find before the first commandment is God saying, I am the Lord your God who redeemed you, who brought you out of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. We're commanded to let nothing come before God. Literally in the Hebrew it is no other gods before my face. You see, God is pictured as being here, we're here. We're not to let anything, any affections, attractions, any devotion come between us and God. It's up to us to guard our hearts. It's up to us to hear this word and let nothing come before his face. And if you're in the expanded version of the catechism, a closer reading of the small catechism expanded portion will show that there are 17 questions that follow this first commandment and answers that address the questions raised by this commandment. In addition, there are 38 Bible passages printed out for us, means saves you a lot of footwork looking up passages and going back and forth. And then there's another 19 Bible references to take you further in depth when the child of God wants to. It's a pretty important resource. What I'm telling you, Christian, is that we mustn't ever slip into arrogance or ignorance, deluding ourselves that eh, we know those things well enough. They don't need to be reviewed. We don't need to be confronted with them again. Well, don't let that happen to you. You see, in growing and knowing him, what happens? We learn and we learn how to revere and love and honor him and rely upon God ever more fully. This is good. That's what he seeks of us. And may he forgive us when we fail to seek him, knowing him better. And may he give us a hunger and thirsting to know and grow in him, for he's given promises. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. <sighs> the rest of the catechism, just simply what follows, Helps us to grow knowing him from the commandments to the creed to the Lord's Prayer to baptism, confession, and the Lord's Supper. And we're just getting back to the basics of who God is and what he's done for us. All from the Word of God, the Bible, 
in an orderly fashion in the catechism. So oh, let's go on to the second commandment, shall we, together? You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not curse, swear, use satanic arts, lie, or deceive by his name, but call upon it in every trouble. Pray, praise, and give thanks. And the central thought is this. When we trust God with our hearts, we use our lips to call upon him as our creator and redeemer. And the Catechism will tell us, as Christians, we treasure and honor God's name with our prayers, our praise, and our witness in life. You see, this isn't just about how God's name comes out of our lips, although it is big on that. But does it slip out of our lips casually, angrily, blasphemously? This also concerns, though, the witness of the life upon whom the name of Jesus and the living God has been placed in holy baptism, one who's redeemed by him. All of our lives are to be lived in honoring of that name. It's bigger than we think. And a closer reading from the expanded version will simply remind us there are six questions that address issues and questions raised by this referenced by this commandment, and 26 Bible passages are printed out for you to help you grow in your thinking about this to form and shape us, as well as 26 additional references of passages you might look up to explore it more fully. That's a pretty big wealth of stuff, 52 passages from God's Word. Certainly plenty of opportunity to escape ignorance when it comes to confessing God's name and honoring it faithfully. But let's go on to the third commandment. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching in his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. The central thought is this. God invites us to rest, to reflect upon his word, and receive his forgiveness in order to strengthen our faith in him. And as Christians, God's word leads us to delight in his wondrous works of creation and redemption. Now, you'll see in the pages that follow, six questions, 19 printed out Bible passages, as well as another 71 references to look up in order to full your thinking on this. Recently, a good friend shared a couple articles with me about the importance of a father leading his family to worship. It seems that the data from a Swiss study was examined and it showed that when a mother alone took her children to church weekly, in the next generation about 2 to 3 percent of those children stayed faithful in the same habit and pattern. If the mother and father did this together, the percentage shot up greatly to like 75 percent. Oddball thing was, if just the dad brought his children to church, and this is not recommending that mothers stay home or anything, but, but if just the dad, how much of an impression this made, it goes even higher. Well, how is that? I don't know. Go figure, except that God does say in his word in Ephesians chapter 6, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Powerful. Oh, and be mindful that as we worship, it's not us giving up time, giving up money, giving up something to the Lord. It's, it's us receiving from him his blessings, his gifts of the forgiveness of sins, the life everlasting, the reassuring, reassurance of the things that he's promised us and the being shaped and molded for better service to him. Each and every time we come together, God has something unique and special in the readings, in the arrangement of the hymns and everything, it's never the same. Even three years when those readings will show up again, the hymns will be different. And there will be different things going on in your life and in worship so that they'll mean something special then that they don't quite mean today. And I want to remind you that worship is like, it's like a live concert in the sense that you can't go back and redo it. And it's not the same watching it on a screen. And you don't get the benefit of participation that faith in singing and confessing expresses. It's really totally unique what happens within the confines of this place. 
and maybe we don't think of that often enough. It's as though God gives us special puzzle pieces each and every Sunday so that the big picture of our life might be more, more visible, more plain. You know, God alone knows the dilemmas that could have been resolved and the comfort that might have been obtained had we paid much closer attention to this command of his and his gracious invitation. But what's the prize over th through it all? It's increased confidence in Christ. This is important for us, but we need to move on. So we ask a question, how important is the word of God? It's everything to the Christian. From God's word, we learn of his law, which condemns and punishes sin. Oh, that leaves us in need of saving. From his word, he calls us to repentance and sorrow over that sin. And in his word, he displays for us a savior, crucified and raised for us, shedding his holy blood to redeem us to God as his children. We too easily forget that, like Jesus told us, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now here, I guess I plead guilty. Too often we couch faith and forgiveness and eternal life into terms that make it seem as if following Jesus is really important, like so important that you have to take a kind of a distasteful medicine. Oh, but you better take it. It's good for you. No, 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 no. Following Jesus isn't distasteful at all. Precious blood-bought children of God, God wants us to delight in him. Think of what this is. How does he want us to delight in him? The way a bride delights in her groom. Think of this. This is really important because we are the bride. He is the groom. Think of the wedding day. And think of the joy you see and the joy as their arm in arm. Bought with the price of the Son of God and his blood. You and I, we belong to him. We're to delight in him. Oh, now, Christian, uh, with those Ten Commandments, don't ever be under the illusion that God gave these and the rest of the commands so that we would keep them and somehow gain our salvation. Da, 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 da. Yes, he wants us to keep them. Yes, he will bless those who keep them. But they're not to save us. They're to live as his children. Our saving and our salvation comes from one and only source, and that's Jesus, our Lord who died and rose to forgive our sins, to reconcile us to our Father, to give, lead us to the new life in the Spirit, all for the sole glory of him, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the commandments do help corral human behavior as, they, as human beings observe them to one degree or another. And they do show us our need to repent, and they do teach us how as a blood-bought child of God we can live and serve and love our neighbor and our God. Now there's one last portion, and that's the close of the commandments. Let's do them together, too. The close of the commandments. What does God say about all these commandments? He says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers unto the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. What does this mean? God threatens to punish all who break these commandments. Therefore, we should fear his wrath and not do anything against them. But he promises grace and every blessing to all who keep these commandments. Therefore, we should also love and trust in him and gladly do what he commands. So these first three commands have much blessing to offer us. And they're summarized in the words we began with. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And next week, we get to see how the child of God is shaped and formed by God's word so that we learn to love our neighbor as ourself. Now may God's rich peace guard and preserve your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.